Hi, it's Victor here from Trend Following Trading for Beginners. And in today's episode, I got special permission from Michael Covell, my teacher, my mentor, who is the author of Trend Following and the Company Channel Trader, uh, which is basically uh, his, this is his recent podcast, Podcast 842, which Michael talks about how he got started in Trend Following, how he got started investigating Trend Following, what he find out about the turtle traders, uh, the rules, the thinking behind, behind it, and basically Mike break it all down to simplest term, and I found it very useful. He put out some question, a nice good question that you know all new trader who uh, who like to you know learn about trend for to think about, and I think it's also useful for other um, system styles as well, and uh, how he lay bare you know more or less what 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 the problems that we face, you know what type of trend following that that. You know, uh, you, you need to understand and, and, and how he can help you and um, you know how, how you can make money without relying on news uh, on the fundamental analysis chartings etc and um, um, basically um, I, I hope you like this and um, but be warned Mike um, have some strong opinion about different styles of, of trading uh, but he's uh, is a very good good manner and uh, but just take a uh, um, pinch of salt so to speak but he uh, is very passionate about trend following. I think we can learn a lot from this guy, from my teacher. Um, and also, if you want to listen to the full episode, you can find the details in the description, which is uh, will point you to Michael's website, and then you can start listening to the full thing. So, enjoy. So my biggest questions are, I always kind of like to go back to the beginning, kind of what got you started on researching the turtle traders? What got you started on writing trading books and going into this? In the early to mid nineties, I was a freshly minted MBA from Florida State University. Not exactly the pipeline to Wall Street, but that's where I wanted to go. I went to the alumni office at Florida State. I found one guy that was on Wall Street. And he was just the recently retired CEO of Solomon Brothers. So my very first Wall Street meeting was with the recently retired CEO of Solomon Brothers, one of the biggest investment banks at the time. That was a great conversation, took a lot of attitude away from him, did not get a job with Solomon Brothers. But walking out of that meeting, within a couple days, I was in a Borders bookshop. I picked up a magazine. It was Wall Street's top 100 paid for the year. In there was these 100 names. Some of them we all know, George Soros, et cetera, stuff like that. But there were some names. I had no clue who they were, but these were men in their 30s and 40s and just making boatloads of money. One guy, I think he was number 35 on the list, was this guy named Jerry Parker. It was like literally three sentences. And it said, Jerry Parker, a turtle trader trained by, maybe it didn't say turtle trader, maybe they said turtle, I can't remember, trained by Richard Dennis, this trader on Wall Street in Chicago, in fact. He had made 35 million bucks at the age of 37 in one year. It said he was not using fundamentals. He was using a trend tracking system. So here I was, a guy who did terrible at accounting, who could have cared less about reading balance sheets. Now here I was reading just a little blurb in a magazine about a guy who was doing none of that and making a fortune. And at that light bulb moment, I was like, well, if he exists, that means anyone can do it. Maybe that's a crazy thought, but that's what I thought. If he exists, and he did exist, I thought anyone could do it, and this must be some kind of secret that they're not talking about in the MBA programs. And that was the start of learning right there. So you start there, obviously, and then now, when did the Turtle Trader actually let you tell the story? So, because we're going to talk about Turtle Traders a lot. What is the, gave your background, now what is the origin story of the Turtle Traders? I'll probably butcher it, but I know it, but I'll probably get it wrong. But I mean, how did it come about? My layman version is I always tell people the best way to figure it out is watch trading places. Now I know it's a lot more elaborate than that, but how did Turtle Traders come about? How did that competition begin? So in the mid 1970s, a close to 300 pounds, six foot two in Chicago named Richard Dennis, was trading on the floor and he was making a bloody fortune. He had made 1 million bucks by the age of 25. 
I mean, fantastic. One million bucks. In, oh, sure. Especially in the 70s. Yeah, one oh, million yeah. bucks in mid-1970s <laughs> when you're 25. He's one of the biggest guys around. Anyways, he makes a couple hundred million by the age of 37, right around the time Trading Places came out around 1982. Now I'm just relaying the story, what happened. I wasn't around at the time. I have to dig back and find and uncover all this. He makes his first million in the mid-70s. He gets to his late 30s. He's made a couple hundred million. In 1981, 1982, there would have been two great traders on the planet, Richard Dennis and George Soros. Mr. Dennis and his partner go to see the movie Trading Places. They walk out and this guy, Richard Dennis, who's made all this money, says, we can do that. And his partner's like, what are you talking about? We can take people off the street. His partner's like, what do you mean we can take people off the street? We can train people to be like me. And his partner's like, no way, man. You're a savant. You're innate. You're a gifted, brilliant dude. We can't make people be like you. And this guy, Richard, was like, no, no, we can't. They made a bet. I don't know if there's really any money. They put ads in the Wall Street Journal and Barron's, and they wanted to hire trainees. Thousands of people replied because a lot of people knew who Richard Dennis was at the time. He was in all the magazines and stuff. They hired around 20 people, 20 students. He nicknamed them the turtles because he had been to a turtle breeding farm in Singapore and he wanted to grow traders like they were growing turtles there. That's one version of the story that I've heard. I've heard he also liked the band, the turtles, happy together song, all that fun stuff. So anyways, he hires these students. He says, okay, sit down in the office. They give them two weeks of training, two weeks. That's it. They give them rules. They say, here are your rules you're going to trade. They stake them with money. Four years later, that group of approximately 20 people, they'd made $100 million profit. Then they left the program. They went out on their own. They all started hedge funds. They all made a ton of money. And then that was when I read the one little article about one of the turtles after he had left the cocoon of working for Richard Dennis. The first question I always, and I'm sure many listeners will come to, and and I've seen the quote many times by Dennis, but it's like, Obviously, you're simplifying years of stuff here, but I mean, if it really is that easy, why doesn't just everyone take two weeks of training and make $100 million? I had a guy in my podcast named Anders Erickson. He is a psychology professor. He is the guy that developed all of the research behind deliberate practice. Malcolm Gladwell took his work and made it more famous. But if you listen to Anders Erickson, if you understand what he's talking about, there's your answer. Most people are just full of shit. Most people are lazy. Most people don't want to do anything. That's why there's casinos in Vegas, because all those folks think they're actually investing when they're sitting at slot machines. There's your answer. You made a point when we talked. You said, I'm five foot eight. I can't be Michael Jordan. Well, you could have been Spud Webb. Spud Webb got to the NBA too. Muggsy Bogues got to the NBA at five three. Now, those are the extreme outliers. You're right. Probably on average, what's the average guy in the NBA? Six foot four, six foot six. But when it comes to the matters of the mind, when it comes to discipline and deliberate practice, there's your answer. Now, look, of course, there's going to be volatility in returns of individuals applying anything. You might do the exact same effort as some guy over here. You might make a million bucks over the course of a lifetime, and maybe he makes a billion. But you know what? You can't use that as a judge. That's freaking luck. I mean, if some young person comes to you and says, hey, my goal is to make a billion dollars, a million, fine, but a billion, come on, that's luck. There's only a couple thousand people on the planet out of 7.5 billion people. I mean, do the statistics. The reality is, is everyone can do well, but they have to understand something like deliberate practice. They have to stick with it. But you know, hey, casinos are easier. Actually, I love that point. Thank you. Because I mean, that's something I talk about on the 150 episodes into the podcast all the time. I'm like, listen, Can you make good money doing this? Especially on one of the things I talk about to a lot of people is make trading like your side hustle. I mean, listen, there's no health insurance in trading. There's no retirement plan. There's no paid time off. There's no benefits at all. But I think that one of the best ways to make some good money to whether pay off debt or save it or go on a vacation is trading. And and I think that one of the biggest reasons we all hear these 90% failure rate stats is because people, they're not happy with 10 grand a month or a hundred grand a year. They want to make that billion and it's just not realistic. That's what I love about what you just said is we call it the steady trade podcast because the idea is, listen, if you learn these rules, whether you're trend following or, or whether you're using some other sort of strategy, you can really 
supplement your income and you can do it from a laptop really anywhere if you follow the rules. If you follow the rules, but most people <laughs> don't want to follow the rules. Look, I get emails all day long. The ideas that people have for trading, the ways they think they can make money, it's pretty loopy out there. I mean, look, unfortunately, and this is not just some tout of my work or my books, they're both, they're all of them, more than two, are very well researched. You can go find all of the end notes, the bibliography, et cetera. It's not just Mike Covell spouting off some opinion. However, you can also go to Amazon and you can find books about GAN and Elliott Wave, day trading at the speed of light. This is all just shit. People think this stuff is true because they can buy a book, but there's like literally no evidence behind it. Is there actually a book called Day Trading at the Speed of Light? I would not be surprised. I mean, I, I'm like, that's an awesome title. Day Trading at the Speed of Light. I sat down with a guy who does trade at the speed of light in Singapore, but he's a professional trader with a staff of 25 and servers out the wazoo. And he's been doing this for 20 years. He kind of understands how to trade at the speed of light. You don't, not you personally, but you personally, me personally, we don't have a freaking clue. We don't have the resources to do anything like that. So what is, again, going back to the story of the turtle traders and what's your, and I know it might be like naming your favorite child, but what's your favorite story or your favorite trader from the turtle traders? So Jerry Parker is the most successful. He's been on my podcast. He's a very meat and potatoes kind of guy, very straightforward. I'm not going to retell any of his stories. People can find those online. He's a pretty luminous guy. He really has got out there and really told the story and given his insights over the years. There's a couple people that are perhaps less well-known. There's one guy who's now deceased, a guy named Mike Shannon. When I first interviewed him, I asked him a question. I said, hey, is there, is there anything? And he had started off as a bartender, this crazy background. I said, is there anything I've not asked you? We were just talking about how he got hired and all that kind of stuff. He actually went to the bottom of some library and found all of the articles on Richard Dennis because he was in all the articles, he read all the articles. So when he went to the interview, he basically was quoting Richard Dennis back to Richard Dennis. That was a good way to get liked. But I asked him in the interview all these years later, I said, hey, is there anything I've not asked you that you want to tell me? Kind of paused and hummed. And he, he said, you know, yeah, I, I was a criminal. I was like the largest Coke dealer in Chicago. And Richard didn't know it when he hired me until, because I was working undercover for the FBI, until the FBI came in one day to brief him. And Dennis, who was famously known as pro-marijuana long before it ever became popular. I mean, Dennis was writing pro-marijuana pieces in the early 80s. Dennis wasn't really that. He didn't really care that much. Shannon kept on working. It was just kind of one of those crazy, crazy stories. Look, and there's also some stories in the turtle world. If people listen to this conversation, and I'm not naming names, people can go find names. There's some folks that really were just full of it. There were some people in the program that did exceptionally well, the majority. I've seen their track records. I posted their track records in my book. They were just the real deal. There were some that were not the real deal. There were some that were just kind of hangers on, did not really go down the right path. Later on in life, I mean, you can find their stories on the internet and it kind of looks like life imploded. They just didn't really do the work. They kind of fell apart. Look, life is funny. You got to stay focused. You got to stay disciplined because even the people that were sitting there in 1983, 84, when the turtle thing started, even some of those people utterly failed and they had all of the advantages and they failed. It's like so many things though. It's like the quote, there's no such thing as an overnight success. And it's like, people want to take, want that shortcut. I mean, Hey, I'm as big a fan of Tim Ferriss as there is, but it's like the hacks only get you so far. At some point you just got to put in the work and you got to have that passion and you got to show up and do all the right things. You gave a great example. You put in, if you drop wing nuts into this system, you're going to get wing nuts out the other side. I mean, that's just the way it works. You make a great point about Tim Ferriss, who I'm fond of, because I think Tim did something very important. Tim basically helped to promote the idea of being an entrepreneur and to do it from anywhere, to use digital technology and to do it from anywhere. Now, some people will get caught up in the minutia 
They'll be like, well, I heard Tim say this exact thing I have to do, and I did that, and it didn't work, so now Tim's a fake or something. It's like, no, no, that's not what he's doing. He's telling you the big picture. You have to get your dusty rear end off the ground and go do the work. But to blame, I know you weren't doing that, but to blame Tim, which some people do, some people blame me, probably some people blame you. You know what I say? Hey, look, the information is out there. You have to take personal responsibility. You have to do something with it. And if you don't, don't send me any whiny emails because I'm just going to delete them anyways. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I'd actually, again, going back to the point where I think four hour work week was published, I think 2008 or somewhere in there, similar time frame to where I was looking to branch out into trading because four hour work week was pivotal for me because I had a business. I built up a business from when I was 22 in roughly 1994. I made every mistake that Ferris said not to do. All I did was made myself a super stressful, highly demanding job. I mean, it was like, yeah, I had a business, which is awesome, but I took phone calls at 2 a.m. I took phone calls at 4 a.m. I made every single entrepreneurial mistake that you could. All I did was, I mean, the business was successful, but I was on the hook 24-7. So if you figured it out, I was making about 10 bucks an hour when I was the business owner. That's why I found Tim found trading and really started, and again, kind of looping back to what I already said, found trend following, found the turtle traders and was like, wait a minute, if these Joe Blows from the newspaper can do it, maybe I can do it too. We should clarify that the Joe Blows were definitely competent people. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, they they weren't like from the homeless shelter or something. No, but you know, one guy though, however, and he's deceased now too, but one guy was a security guard at the Chicago Board of Trade living over top of a saloon. Now, look, that doesn't mean he did not have a good IQ and wasn't a smart guy, but I think sometimes we all get caught up in some of that stuff. The reality is you got to dig a little deeper. I know this is kind of a broad question, but especially with your research in the turtle traders, kind of turning that, and I know it's not the best term, but I just always think of it as that guy on the street or that gal on the street into a successful trader. Most of our listeners are new traders. They're they're coming to this podcast because they're looking to learn this stuff. We talk about the basics here. You're not talking about advanced anything here. It's more just kind of getting started. What's your best advice for Joe or Jane Sixpack that are one month into trying to pursue trading for realistic income. We're not talking to people that want to buy a Lambo next week. Okay. I don't want to talk to those people at all. What's the advice for somebody that wants to make some good money that can improve their life over time? I think the first thing is to think about when one will enter and when one will exit. So if we talk about buy and hold, which is the mantra, you're basically just buying. There's no exit. But if you're going to be a trader, a trader has to have an exit. You got to know that exit before you ever get in. If you're a trader, you're gonna have your entry rule. I'm going to enter XYZ market. You're gonna have to figure out what markets you're gonna follow, what markets you're gonna track. It should not be everything. It should be a narrow universe, well under 100 things you should be following in your life. You do not need to follow thousands and thousands of stocks. They're all correlated at 100% to begin with, so you're just overkill. Once you have that group of markets to follow, you need a way to say, I'm in. Okay, now you place a trade. Now what? Well, the now what should have been known before you got in. Meaning, if you're going to get in, you have to know before you get in when the hell you're getting out. If you don't know when you're getting out, when you get in, you're back at Vegas at the freaking one-armed bandit stuffing the slot machine. Perfect. Again, I know you have no time to listen to this podcast, but I promise you that is something that I talk about in 90% of these episodes is have a plan is what I call it. I mean, it's like, and have a rationale. And obviously you've gotten the emails, you've talked to the people. It blows me away how many people are like, I'm in this stock. What do I do? First of all, I'm like, okay, why'd you buy it? Well, it was going up. Okay. Well, that was it. Okay. What's your stop? Well, I'll stop out if it doesn't work. And I'm like, what is any, you're talking gibberish here. You bought it for one reason because it was going up. You're going to stop out if it doesn't work. Does that mean it drops 1%, 10%, 100%? That is, I love that. Thank you, because it's something that I preach all the time. Let me add on top of that, though. 
the turtle mentality, which is this turtle trading that we've been talking about, this nickname is based on a form of trading called trend following, which is another title of one of my books. This mentality is very different than what most new people expect. It was different for me. Most new people expect, okay, I need to know what the crop reports say. I need to know what the analysts say about Microsoft. What's the PE ratio? What's the balance sheet? What's all of this data? Data that never ends, never ends. Oh, especially now. I think about back when the turtles were trading. It's it, like well, there was a look. I mean, there was still the Fed back then. There was sure, fair enough. The data never ends. So all of this data. So you got to say to yourself, okay, my first goal is to enter. My second goal is to exit and make some money. If you're using all this data, how the hell do you decide what's useful, what's not useful, what's valid, what's not valid? It's overwhelming, and you're competing against the likes of Warren Buffett and Goldman Sachs, who actually do know how to use this information in a way at a different level than you. The great thing about the turtle story was they said, take all that information, can it, put it to the side, don't think about it. What the turtles were taught, when the market is moving up, you should be going with the market. When the market is going down, you should be going with the market. What you do is you take all of that fundamental information and you reduce it to one number, one number only, which is the price of the market. For example, if Tesla is at 100, you decide, okay, Tesla is moving up. I'm going to get into it. It moved to 150. I'm going to get into Tesla. Hold on. That's an all-time high. 150 at one point in time and Tesla was an all-time high. Okay. So now I'm long Tesla at 150. That's the all-time high. People are thinking, oh my God, I got to buy cheap. I want to wait for the pullback. No, 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 you don't. You want to be going for momentum. Now you buy Tesla at 150. What do you do? You wait. You wait. You wait and wait and wait till you get a stop. That's the name of the game. Now, the thing is, when you trade this way, when you trade on price, when you trade on momentum, if you got in at that 150 on Tesla, you don't have to know why it went to a thousand where it seems to be going. You don't have to know any reason why it went there because at the end of the day, forget the name of the market, take Tesla, throw that away. If a market, whatever market, goes from 100 to a thousand, why would you care what name that market is, what stock it is? Why would you care what the name is if you're on board and it goes from 100 to a thousand? Why do you care what the name is? You don't care what the name is. You could care less what the name is. All you care about is did I get on board and go from 100 to 1,000? That's what's important. The name is not important. The fundamentals are not important. What they're saying on CNBC, Bloomberg, et cetera, not important. Wall Street Journal, not important. New York Times, not important. What's on Facebook, what's on Twitter, finance Twitter, not important. Zero importance. The daily riffraff, the daily analysis, not important. None of it's important. The only thing that matters is, were you on board when it went from 100 to 1,000? Now, if you have some deep-seated, daddy's psychological issue where you need to talk to people all the time and you need to kind of share your feelings. Okay, then I get it. But that's not about making money. That's your deep-seated daddy issue. I love that you chose that example because it's the perfect stock for that because it's you look at one Tesla crashes somewhere in Mississippi and everyone loses their mind. What does that matter if the stock's up every single day for the last four months. I mean, obviously there's red days, but all you got to do is draw a trend line going back to last October or whatever. And it's like, none of that noise matters. And you could read every single article on both sides of that. And you could dig into the fundamentals and you could see Elon's crazy tweets, but none of it matters when the stock just goes up every day. All of the fundamental information, I'll be point blank about this, all of the fundamental information about Tesla there's absolutely no way that anybody listening has any evidence that that fundamental information in Tesla is anything other than mental masturbation. That's all it is. Well said. Love it. Love it. Kind of last couple questions. I got two more for you. Do you have any, again, I try not to be too much of a fanboy, but do you have any upcoming books, any upcoming projects, anything you're working on? There's a trader that I've had on my podcast who I've had on a lot. His name is Tom Basso. He was featured in the book, The New Market Wizards. Two books that I would recommend that your readers definitely check out if they've not seen. Market Wizards, New Market Wizards. We, it was Jack Schwager came on about a month ago. He was awesome. Tom Basso is featured in The New Market Wizards. Tom kind of, he spent a lot of time on my podcast. 
we decided to go ahead, me and him, to do a book together using his podcast episodes as a foundation. So that's coming in 2020. Something else is in the works, a little bit of a, another documentary I did one years ago, and that is in the works and coming. Which I remember that. That was crap. Was it cheap? 10 years ago. 10 years ago, about the financial crisis. It was awesome, by the way. This new one is going to be in the headspace of where we've been talking today. The documentary before was called Broke. There was a sheep on the cover that was shaved. That's why you were- Fair enough. Fair enough. Okay. That's where it was coming from. All right. Which I loved. I remember watching that back then. I mean, so well done. Man, it's pretty wild to think back. That was that long ago. But yeah, definitely check out Broke. Is it everywhere? I'm assuming- What's everywhere? It's been 10 years. It's online. You can view it online. It's on Vimeo. You can rent it on Vimeo, that kind of stuff. Fair enough. Perfect. Perfect. Awesome. So no, highly recommend it. Love that. I was going to say the trend following book, there's been five editions. If people do check that out, they should check out the newest edition. It's like three pounds. It's 220,000 words. If you can't finish reading it because maybe you have some kind of mental imbalance, you can use it as a weapon to kill people. (laughs) Last question is, and I've been kind of curious about this for years, really, was fortunate enough to have Jim Rogers on the podcast about, I think it was back last summer, Jim famously relocated to Asia, and I talked about his rationale and his why. I know you, I think you're, I might be wrong, I think you're full time there, you spend most of your time there. As a guy that my kids are kind of growing up, I'm always kind of looking for options. What was your why behind moving to Asia? Was it? taxation or was it just, what was it? I've had a chance to go spend time with Jim multiple times over the years. He's been on my podcast too. I've had a chance to, I'm only about an hour and a half flight from Singapore, but he's great. I was happily spending time in America for most of my life. And I got hired on a speaking tour of Asia in 2013. It was going to be a four month tour. I was going to be in, I don't know, 10 countries. When it was over, I said to myself, I really don't have any desire to leave. So I stayed. That was it. That was the rationale. And the energy, if you're in any mega Asian city, whether that's Tokyo, Shanghai, Hong Kong, Shenzhen, Kuala Lumpur, Singapore, Saigon, Bangkok, these places have energy that America doesn't have. Now, you could find a hell of a lot of energy in New York City, no doubt. But beyond New York City and perhaps Vegas, but the kind of Vegas energy is a little bit different. That's more crazy But the energy in Asian cities cannot be replicated. It can't be replicated. You literally wake up every day saying, let's go take it on. Whereas we all know what can happen to us in America. We get a house in the burbs. We sit around. We get fat. We watch TV. We see the same neighbors every week. And it gets pretty damn boring. I've watched people come to Asia. I've watched people specifically come to Saigon, where I spend a lot of time. To watch their attitudes, to watch their energy change, it's amazing. Too few Americans, we really don't get out and do it. But i got to say, look, what are you holding on to? If you got some cash, if you got some mobility, all you have holding you back is fear. No, that's incredible. I mean, you know, it's one of the things I have to admit. Again, I'm almost 50 and I've never been to Asia. And just hearing Jim's story and especially hearing yours, it, I kind of figured that's what it was, is just kind of that whole vibe that whole developing nation it's not just developing we're talking cities most mega asian cities make almost every city in america look like a piker i'm not being mean or anti-american i'm american i'm happy to have my passport but the energy and the building and the economic development and the growth and the people what's happening across asia that's where the middle class growth is i mean you got a kid in america and he's learning spanish over some asian language I would argue that most parents in America have failed. I mean, I have to admit, as a parent, my kids are taking Spanish because it's the only language that's offered. I mean, I'm glad they're learning it. But I mean, obviously, Jim's a huge advocate of that, teaching his kids Mandarin and everything. But I totally agree. It's it, it does bum me out. You know? <laughs> Listen, as you say, because we're roughly the same age, as you say, as you talk about these issues, it's tough. And I'm not trying to be too cavalier. I get the fears. I get the great unknown, but we're all connected. The one thing that you learn, which is fantastic, except for mainland China, except for mainland China, when you go to mainland China, basically nothing works. I mean, I'm talking Google, Facebook, your email, forget it. It doesn't work. Hopefully your VPN will stay working, 
But everywhere else, you land and you're connected and you're not far away. Yeah, you might be distance far away to people, but you're still close. We just don't have that sense until we go and do it. Once you go, then you get that feeling of like, oh, I'm not that far away. And then you get to have this whole other second life that most people don't get a chance to experience. Highly recommend it. Well, I would like to thank you, Michael. Again, we met these going on 10 years ago. Your books, the podcast, I mean, can't recommend it highly enough to all of you out there listening. I mean, go to trendfollowing.com. I mean, Michael's got multiple websites, but the one I have in front of me right now is trendfollowing.com. There's links to the books, the podcast, tons. I mean, he puts tons of free stuff out there. I mean, listen, I mean, first of all, I think you should buy the $20 books. If you're not willing to buy $20 or $30 books, you're not going to succeed no matter what. If you're not willing to commit that 20 bucks, 30 bucks and eight hours to read the book or whatever it is. But he also puts out tons of free content and has been putting it out free for when did your podcast start? When did you start? 2013. Got to add a side note on the books though. I have to say, as you're giving me a promotion to buy for people to buy a $20 book, I think over the course of my lifetime, I've purchased over a thousand books from other people. You're right on about books. So just to clarify, it's not just me making some money. Of course, I'm a capitalist. I like to make money. But hey, I buy books and I have been buying books like crazy forever. I'm an avid reader. I talk about it on the podcast all the time. 90% of the reason I wanted you on here is because of your writing and how valuable I think it is. And I just think that it's like, especially to me, and, and I know we joked about social media and Facebook a little bit, but it's like, I've always been an avid reader, especially since the election as social media just went completely off the rails in 2016. I've been pulling back more and more and just reading more books because it's like, man, you have to actually think. Obviously, we all know how the algos work at like Facebook. I mean, they just put in stuff in front of you to make you mad. That's how the algo works. I mean, just if you want to learn an investment strategy, learn to be disciplined, learn to repeat some sort of system, go to books, man. Get off the internet. I concur. I'd like to thank you again, Michael. And this was good stuff, man. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Dan. Appreciate it. So I hope you like this podcast, the clips from the, um, Michael's recent podcast interview. And um, the tick, here are some of the takeaways I, I found, especially, I mean, it's very, um, well, if you have listened to my podcast, um, all the other podcasts I have on on um, on, on, on this um, place, basically you will find that a lot of things that I've said already is already repeated by him. Obviously, I learned from this guy. And... Um, a lot of things is basically quite useful here. Is like first of all, um, basically, um, there's stop loss. Every time you go into um, take a trade, no matter what system you use, you must have an entry and stop loss at the same time, right? You need to s- define your risk. It's no point to have a system or, or anything that you use. Uh, basically, just go in the market. They'll tell you when to get out. Now, this stop loss is very different for different people. Uh, for different system, but you must have a stop loss, where basically is to help you to um, keep your basically keep keep your uh, trading account intact, so you don't lose too much in any one trade. But also, like I said before, also help you your mental state, so you don't get overly you know worried and sad and start to get angry and blame other people. So you can have a you know even key on your mental state. It's it's um, um it's very important. And the the other thing is, um, it doesn't really matter what you trade. The takeaway here is that you, you, whatever the name it is, doesn't matter. It's the same rule, same set of rules. You know, it, it doesn't matter what what people say either, what news says either, what even your own opinion says either. I mean, you have to have a system, and you basically just follow the price. For for me, the the way I trade using end of day price, because I'm looking the medium or long term, and I always put my hands up, I'm not a day trader. Um, you can use it in day trading. I mean, just look at your know, sample rate, you know, let's say, you know, I don't know, 200 day moving average, but not based on day, but based on, I don't know, the 10 minutes chart or one hour chart, but then it loses the, the the essence of trend following. Essence of trend following is catching the big long trend, big long trend takes months and years to set up. 
and then when you play it out, it probably take weeks and months to play out as well. Sometimes it can be years, and um, and you just if you just use it as a, for day trading, it just it just not very useful because you only hit just getting a little bit of the money out of the market from a big huge trend, and you have to keep on doing it and in and out in the market, and you basically just have to sit in front of a computer all day to trade, and also if you have to incur um, um, payment to your uh, broker. That's another cost that you you can do away with. Okay, so basically, you just you need the price, end of day price, no opinions, and even no fundamentals. I mean, to a lot of people, they may not like it, but remember what what happens before back in our eight or seven, and even before that, um, a lot of um, the fundamental analysis, fundamental data that's available uh, for a particular you know market or s- company or stock, whatever. It can be doctor. Remember Enron. Enron even created a whole floor of a trading floor to, for to show analysts and other regulator or people, you know, news, news analysis, whatever, come coming to to look at what they're doing. But basically, just look a show, you know, using some employee to show you, show people that they they have a uh, energy trading floor, you know, and calling, making making bets and make their you know, and and hedging and so forth. But it's all a lie. And also, I, I'm from Hong Kong. I, I know, you know, I'm not saying people are doing uh, incorrect things, but within accounting, by law, you're allowed to do certain stuff. And what I call this creative accounting. So you can hide losses in certain ways. You know, you can call us like different names. And then, so long as you work within the accounting rules, whichever country you op- uh, the company operates, it'd be fine, so long as within the rules. Same thing for dot com. Remember the dot com in old days? I mean, if you have trade in you know, the you know dot the dot com time, two thousand and three, two thousand two thousand and three, a lot of company doesn't even have any making any money. They have an idea, they launch internet, but how how you go rate those kind of company using fundamental data? They have no sales, or very little sales. They haven't make any money yet. They've been burning loads of money to you know create the awareness, you know, get people to buy things. And they came on losing money. So how you go to use fundamental analysis to rate such a company? So they come up with, you know, a beta, <laughs> sort of a special thing that only just happens from 2000, 2003, you know. Basically, just a projection of, you know, if you have current sale, this is project how much you can make money. That's before tax and authorization and all sort of thing. But before 2000, the do- do- before the dot-com actually happens, a beta is never there. Now we also use it as well. And so rules can change and people can lie and fundamental analysis, if you just want to use the the data, you know, g- given by the company, it can be doctored, it can be lied, it can be, you know, or fraudulent. So using fundamental analysis is not, you know, going to help you in some cases. Okay, then that that's the main takeaway here, just using my own, uh, own trading experience. So, um. Basically, you don't even need to know why. Why the price move up and down? All you do is look at the price. You have your rule, your trading rules. It said, okay, using turtle, tur- turtle trading system, the system two here. If the price move up, you know, for more than fifty-five days in a row, or well, not, not, or not together, but you know, to make it fifty-five days high. Okay, then you just go and buy, and then when the price go down, you know, uh, below twenty days low, you get out. It's all stated there in um, the company total trader book uh, from Michael. And it doesn't even say anything about, you need to know why the, the price move up. It's very much like a, a server. You go it to serve, you, you might heard about some place uh, for a good wave, or you look at the weather, you know, per- particular season, you go wave to go serve the wave, but you don't really want to care how the wave was made. All you want to know is I want to serve the wave. Where can I go? Where where can I, you know, go have some fun serving the wave? And you go to that place. That's it. Why do you want to know how, I don't know, how the moon works or how, you know, the the earth temperature have um, uh, anything to do with, the you know, how high the wave is, that kind of stuff. You don't care. You just want to ride a goddamn wave. Part of my language, but that's all you need to do. You just want to go wave. So why do you need to know why? You don't need to know why. You know, the the price tells you everything. And your system tells you when to get in and out. And your rule, your trading rule, tells you how much to, to risk. So why? Why do you need to know why? 
don't care. You don't really care when CNBC or all these talking heads on, on news uh, tell you what they think. Because a lot of it, to, to be fair and honest, they don't even know. They don't know. <laughs> Some of it could be just like what they think, their opinion. Uh, but when they got it wrong, you know, they, they don't repeat, they don't tell you, don't come and say, sorry, I got it wrong. You know, they, they don't do that. And the other thing is um, about human behavior. Human just, I, I don't know about you, but I, I was lazy. I was trying to, uh, when I first started trading, I just want money for nothing, or very little money, and just, you know, dream of big. We don't do much work. And uh, I found out to my own detriment that's not the way to trade. That hurts your account. And I slowly, you know, I, I never give up. I, I get frustrated. I get beaten up by the market like everybody else or the new trader. But one thing somehow inside me just keeps on saying, you know, there is a chance here, there's a possible um, options that you can take here. You know, if you do well, you, you can... You can have a um, basically a handle. Uh, uh, you you can steer your your life. You know, instead of asking people for a job or something, uh, and asking some pension fund manager to look after your pension for you, can actually take your own money and then drive it. At least when you fail, you learn something. And I just continue, continue, never, never stop. And that that's how I learn. Of course, also uh, you, you learn from from your mistakes, and uh, a lot of mistakes I made. And it it all takes time. You know, slowly I learn about it, and then just like because I'm a I'm a software guy, I also do a lot of support. You know, once you fix one bug, you know that bug sh- will never happen. And um, that's of software. But human being, we seems to keep on doing the same old stupid things until it register in our brain. Then we stop, and then we I I probably be I basically put in process in place to say don't do this, and I have chart print down and say I was doing stupid thing here. And then you know, keep on reading every you know uh, every so often, a couple of months, how something just look at. Sometimes when I'm doing nothing, I just read, going through my old chart to see how, especially stupid things I've done, and just remind myself, I can be very stupid. You know, I'm a human being. I can make stupid mistakes, and if I do stupid things, this is what you get. You you, you get slaughtered by the market. And I remember, and I not try to over trade or you know pick it too much of a size that kind of stuff. You know, it, it sort of helped me, but yes, I was lazy. That's was something that um, Michael talks about. And um, and the other thing is, uh, what what's the point to predict? There's no point to predict. You got the price right. That's end of day price. It's common. Everybody knows about it. You know, like down Jones, end of day price, everybody knows it make a thousand point or, or below gone down two thousand point. Everybody knows. And that's the price it all you need to know. And then you can use that to your I mean for for uh, getting your signals. Okay? All all I do is just use well the price when the when the uh, when the market start, when the market stop and the highest of the day, the lowest of the day, that's it. So I, I use that for, for down Jones trading. And uh, I sometimes look at the volume, but, you know, that's more facial than, you know, do, doing any data analysis of it. I don't even use volume. And um, I just use my system. There's no prediction. Um, I don't even look at charts that often. I just, like, you know, go through my analysis. Uh, I, I do just for sure look through my chart. I don't put too much um, uh, emphasis on it. I just always take my trading signal based on my system. And that basically my my strategy. And the other things I think we ought to remember is, you know, strategy. You need to learn, you know, like, okay, when to get in, when to get out. But you need to learn how to trade in both up and down market. I mean, he, Michael said it said already. I mean, you go against human um, emotion to buy high and still higher. So the price, let's say Amazon, gone up to a thousand. You you say, okay, it's too high. Wait until five hundred. No, it might never come down to five hundred. It might go to two thousand or go to the moon. So what you do, you just buy buy small, buy a little bit, to uh, one thousand. And if the price continue moving in your favor, let's say in a hundred points up, two hundred points up, you just buy a little bit more, a little bit more, and that's how you make money in trend following. And same thing for shorting. When the price go down, short it. Like the recently, what happens? Okay, if you know how to short the market, you're able to have the instrument to do so. Last three weeks, you've been making money. You're minting it. You've been making loads of money, but you need to have the mindset to be able to you know, sell and sell lower still and short the market, still sell and still sell, sell lower. But you need to have the way, you know, the thinking behind it, also the system that should allow you to do that. But most of all, is you, you must allow yourself, you know, trade the market 
for train following, we train trains. So we for the train to happen, which I'll talk about, and and then you wait for it to happen, and you jump on board when your system says so, and you wait for it to play out, and you that that's it. You just you train follow. You you not um, try to predict anything, but train only happens about thirty percent of the time. So most of the time, there's a train follow. You get you know get hurt quite a bit. You know we call whipsaw. By the market because most of the time the market is doing a side sideway trend. You know, it's just moving sideways, it's not mo- making you big trend. But every so often, um, more from my own announcement and experience as well, happen two three times a year. The problem is you don't know when it happens, so you just have to take every trade from your system, and when it happens, you stay there. So that's the next next thing I talk about. Be patient, be patient to wait for that signal, and just get on with it. But because you don't know. You have to take everything that I said, but sometimes you know that signal lashes on a trend, a good trend, a good long trend. And what you need to do, you wait for the setup, you wait for your system, your system tell you to go in, then you wait, wait for your system to tell you to get out, while you're minting it, while you're making money, okay. And a lot of people spend a lot of time waiting. I did that before, and then when you actually latch onto a good trend. You uh, get scared. You forgot the rule. Basically, wait, wait until the system tells you to get out, and um, that is the type of thing that you need to do. But unfortunately, um, a lot of time you don't really do that, and you don't wait, and then you get out early, and what you left a lot of money on the table. So when you scare, um, worry about losing your profit, you get out early. Yeah, you lose a lot of profit. Because you put your potential profit could be much higher if you have followed the the market, follow your system. Yes, most of the time you probably be right. You probably make you know, um, I don't know. You you just say you go in one hundred and you make five hundred out of that. Fine, but you know th- your trade might go up to thousand or two thousand. Most of the time you probably win. You make your your you know from one hundred to five hundred, but you always. Will miss out the big long term. Will make you well, make make you lose some money, and those have paid up all your small losses as well. And that is very difficult. That waiting, waiting to to do thing to actually sit on the on your hands, waiting for the trade to work. I mean, for example, last three weeks you're waiting, sit on your hands, um, for the system to to actually you know to play out this downtrend. Okay, now it's more or less finished, but you know, it took three weeks. And normally, it could probably take months, you know, for this kind of downtrend, a couple of months or something like that. But only it'll play out in three weeks, and um, you need to sit down and discipline and just wait for the market to turn. The market now turn, okay? Now, fair enough. Uh, I'm talking about the 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 U- U- U.S. market here, and you basically can okay, it's so short. You should get out now because your system should say tell you to do so. My did, my short term one did, and um, I just reverse and go go long now. But all of that have to wait, wait for the for the price to you know to go up, and wait for the price to continue to finish its job, and then you wait for the signal to get out. That's that's discipline, and that's the next thing you have to have discipline, and you have to have your rules. Don't force it. You know you wait and discipline, waiting, uh, follow your routine, follow the system, follow the step consistently. Over time, you make consistent money because you will have. Consistently follow your rules. Some of those uh, trade, which in this case uh, you think of probability. Some of those trades will turn out to be bad. Some of them turn out to be good. Some of them turn out to be really good, and some of them turn out to be really bad. Your job is to t- cut all those big bad trade, big long uh, um, losses, big large losses that can you know kill your account, kill your emotion, really hurt you emotionally. And um, you basically just want to cut those out, but you let the other thing go, the big fat tail that go in your favor, that run, that got legs and run and run, like shorting here. You know, last three weeks, more or less, you shot, or like even the last two weeks, it got legs. I mean, I, I never seen anything like this. You know, come down there, thousand pound, two thousand pounds, almost three thousand pound at a time. But you, you wait, you you let the system go, let let it um, let it do its job, and you just wait. And that is important. That, that if you follow it through, and you make lots of money, but a lot of time this discipline comes with your experience, okay? And you actually make money out of using a system, and you know that you can make money. Then you understand then that 
but only after you have makes quite good money out of it, then you have got more trust trusting of your own system because you know it it, it will make you good at the end. But you just have to wait and you know follow your your system, and that's what discipline come comes into into play. And the other thing is, yeah, like I said before, I was lazy before, and I I got the urge to continue. I always want to find a way to drive, you know, to have a you know a way to drive my own uh, future, and you know have, have my own set of money, so I can you know go and work or not go to work. I have my means, you know, to control my my future. And trend following is something that I found, you know, because. Okay, I'm an engineer you know, uh, from university. I uh, also do software development. I'm very much logical guy, logical thinking. I find trend following very logical, easy for me to understand. But uh, it does have its, you know, difficulties, difficult things like waiting, disciplines, and not only see and do your job. And you know, you have to every day, you know, check the price. At the end of the day, you check the price, and you have to go keep on doing it every day. It does take a bit of discipline. And so, trend following is not for everyone. In my view, but also the the biggest drawback trend for for most people is the emotion. The emotional side of thing is not talked enough. I think in most books, you can get books about it in you know, training psychology, but um, it's not it's not doesn't really come out from Michael's book. And I found that you know um, I need to get other extra book to talk to 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 work on on that one. Um, but I think you know the the rules and stuff from Michael is really great. You know he put it into nice way to actually how how you can digest it. But I think a lot of it's that emotion, that emotion of of us, our lizard brain work against us. We really work against us. And if you don't have the discipline and the tenacity or, or the you know that have you just to follow it, believe in it, and following it and trusting it, you you will fall in the wrong wrong, wrong side. Okay, and and um, it's definitely not. Um, I'm making my quick make making money quickly scheme. You know, you you it takes years to uh, to accumulate your wealth. It takes time, and you just have to you know follow the system. And um, yeah, you you also the other thing you need to reset your expectation here. You might be, I think Michael said in this podcast really well. I mean, how, how many how, how many people are like Paul Jerry Jones or Jerry Packer? They are there. They're some of your my my uh, heroes, so to speak. But you know, how 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 many of you actually want to put in the hard work, have the mental discipline, and the never give up attitude to make a billion dollar? Tell me, everybody wants to run the uh, win the lottery, but nobody wants to make do the work. Can you actually make money from the market, following sets of rules, and be at it and at it and at it for t- 10, 20, 30 years, and then make your billion? But at the start of your journey, you don't know you make billions. Some of us will never reach that. Most of us won't. But it should be quite profitable for most of us. You know, it depends how how much you know you stick to it, and also the market condition, wherever you're trading. You never know what you know. Suddenly happens. You can make loads of money, but I we can never promise how much you're gonna make because it really depends on the market, how much it's willing to give you. But I'm sure we can all make money out of it. But you need to stick with the rules. But if you actually think using trend following or whatever other method out there who tells you you can make loads of money in what eighteen months, ten thousand dollar into twenty five thousand twenty five million? Yeah, it's possible. If everything's set out right. But that only per- happen only to that person, that one person they talk about. Can they repeat and repeat, repeat, repeat? It's difficult. I mean, I think Team Skype is doing um, um, penny penny share trading. He he does have his own uh, inner circle teaching people. You know, starting from two thousand and and continue make, make millions. Yeah, but that taking him two years, and loads of people apply. Not many people make it. And uh, and they do a lot of hard work behind the scene. You might see a lot of his failure. Or think it looks really simple and easy. Even show you how that he does it. But it took him years to learn that experience, to learn that discipline, to learn that approach. He can teach you, but you have to then learn it yourself too. Are you willing to do the hard work? That is very important. And the expectation, you might you might not get it. You might may not become a billionaire. 
or millionaire, but will you still continue? Let's say, assuming you never become a millionaire, but you make hundreds of thousands of pounds, uh, and it's enough to you know send your kids to school, send you know get them to a good university, and they don't have to uh, pay for the university loans, student loans. I think it's worth it, or have the pension on the side. Uh, that um, you can at least you know able to look after your own self, old age. I think it's worth it. Instead of paying somebody else to do it for you, and you learn how to do the you know trade the market, and you can continue to trade after sixty five. I mean, most of us live nowadays up to for men anyway, up to about eighty five. So you can trade another twenty years. You don't have to worry about somebody else. You know, not not accepting you because you're too old. Now you 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 have your your skill your drive in your hand you can do something about it, okay. And also the other thing Michael talks about, which I I sort of do as well. I learned to do that from Michael and other people as well. Basically, reading books. I I don't read books as much in having a book reading it, but I do the other way. Basically, audible. I I have I said in some of my podcasts I have audible, uh, subscription. <coughs> Then that's a uh, what you call. Seven ninety nine, eight quid, and every month I just um, get one book, download one book, and read about, it, listen to it. So when I'm driving to work, I listen to it. When I'm um, running, I listen to it, and so forth. So that that's how I, how I um, go around reading books. I also use um, a Kindle as well from Amazon, but um, I, I never really buy paperback unless I can find it, you know, somewhere. Um, cheaply or something, because I think um, what you call audible book is much better for you, for me. Basically, it's just my lifestyle, and uh, if it's digital, it's easier instead of in books. You know, I need to find somewhere to to physically store it. I prefer in digital format. I can easily store on on the cloud or, or my uh, Google uh, Mail allowance. You know, they give you 15 gig. That's quite a lot of you know data you can just store there. So um, basically, that that is the the takes I've got um, from takeaway from from this podcast, and I put some of my feelings and uh, how how I think it uh, all um, should be put together, how it affect me basically. And okay, by all means, I I'm I, I'm the the least you know expert on on trend following. Michael and his books taught me a lot, and his podcast continue pod uh, um, taught me a lot. I, I recommend you actually go and. Uh, trendforing. dot com and uh, listen to Michael's podcast, especially the early one. It's uh, very raw, very straightforward and direct, and I like it. You know, just they don't. There's no BS there, and um, Michael's style's、uh, podcast is really good. So、um, if you look go into description of this podcast, then you'll be able to、um, get the details of this. You know,、uh, episode eight hundred. I、uh, was eight hundred forty-two, and all his other podcasts, and there's also on his website. There's a lot of free um, 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 information out there, resources for you. I think he also gives you a, a a free DVD talking about trend following and, and his takes on it and the, the mindset and stuff. So go go to his website, okay, and check it out. As, and、um, you should find the detail in the description as well. I hope you like this podcast, and I will speak to you next week. Bye for now.